without commenting on anybody's motives today, historically, opposition to immigration in the United States has been racially and religiously motivated in the ugliest, nastiest way possible. Hi, I'm Matt Welch for Reason TV. I'm at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas with one of the single most influential private citizens in Washington, D.C., Grover Norquist. Grover, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah. We're in the middle of talking about immigration reform in this country. You have been pushing very hard for immigration reform for about 30 years. There's a lot of sort of Republican conservative grassroots opposition to this that we see in the House of Representatives. Don't the opposition have a point about kind of the largeness and unwieldiness of the bill? What you're trying to reform is a big, messy collection of previous pieces of legislation. So if you're going to address all the stupid things we've been doing, um, you're gonna, it's going to be a long bill. Uh, we could do it piecemeal, except there's a lot of opposition by the labor unions, the left. Uh, the, the reason why we're in the mess we're in is that organized labor didn't like the guest worker program we had under Eisenhower, so they killed it. The reason we're in the mess we're in is that they put in regulations in the 20s, which was discriminatory and deliberately meant to be, and we're trying to extricate ourselves from that history and come up with a reasonable level of immigration. We have a 55 mile an hour speed limit immigration policy when the cars and the roads are built for 75 and 80. And we didn't, when we had the 55 mile an hour speed limit under Carter, run around saying we must enforce the law first. And before we consider changing the 55 mile an hour speed limit, we must imprison everybody who was involved in the illegal speeding. That's silly. You say you change the stupid law and then you enforce it. We need to reform immigration so we have dramatically higher levels of immigration, both of high-skilled and of low-skilled people. That's what built the country. It's what makes us different than the rest of the world. It's why we're the future and China isn't, uh, is how well we do immigration. And we've been doing it with one hand tied behind our back with stupid laws. Let's move in the direction of having the laws catch up with our reality, which is we've been very welcoming to 11 million people. We put up a bid sign that said, jobs available, help wanted, and there was another little sign over saying, don't cross this line. And they decided to react to reality, which was the draw of jobs and opportunity, rather than the little official sign that said, don't, don't do what we're asking you to do. You hear a lot of uh, discussion from Republican opponents of comprehensive reform, and also from gleeful Democrats, that this issue threatens to sort of rip apart the Republican GOP conservative coalition. Is that true and sort of slash, why has this become such an emotional question, particularly for opponents of reform? It's very interesting. First of all, this is a problem for the Democratic Party. It's the Democrats that spent the first two years of Obama's administration not doing anything. Why? Because they're paralyzed by organized labor, by their radical environmentalists, who don't like people at all, uh, and the uh, union people who don't want more people coming in and working. So Obama, who killed the 2007 bill by coming in with the amendment to do in a guest worker program, then becomes president, says he's for all this stuff, doesn't lift a finger for the two years when he could have done it any day of the week. So he now has to come and pretend to be for it. I worry that he has every intention of killing it, hoping that Republicans will get the blame. Within the center-right, you have some people, like uh, John O'Sullivan, uh, foreigner, came to our country uh, to write for National Review, uh, doesn't understand America. He's still British. He thinks that we're just Britain move west. He doesn't understand we're a country that decided not to be Britain. Affirmatively, we're not you. We're out of here. And he gave a speech 20 years ago saying, Immigrants come here, they go on welfare, they become Democrats, this is bad. And I went up to him afterwards and said, you gave an interesting speech on the evils of welfare. Why would you drag the immigrants into it? Most of the people whose lives are damaged by welfare and dependency from welfare were born here. I mean, the tip of the iceberg is the immigrants who showed up, not, but most of the people are Americans who welfare hurts. Why didn't you talk about welfare? You thought you were talking about immigration. And he said, well, of course, that is the problem. 
but we can't reform welfare and we can keep the immigrants out. Well, actually, you haven't been able to keep the immigrants out, and we can reform welfare, even under Clinton as president. Including a, a, a much ignored provision blocking much of welfare to illegal immigrants at the yeah. time. There are a lot of people who are mad about welfare, but they scream at immigrants. They're mad about the entitlement programs, like the Heritage Foundation, which says, do you know that immigrants come in would get three times as much out of Medicare as they put in? It's also true about babies born in the United States. We have a flawed uh, entitlement program. Why would you pick out immigrants as opposed to everybody else? Uh, and then they say our, our uh, education system doesn't work and people don't learn to write English and American history very well. Yeah, I went through it. It sucks for people who are born here. So there's this weird transference of frustration. We can't reform education, but we could keep them out of it. We can't reform entitlements, but we could keep them out of it. So instead of fixing the flaws in the United States, we're trying to call names for immigrants. The problem is it distracts you from the real problem, our entitlement programs, our welfare system, our unionized and bureaucratized education system, and redirects people's animus at completely innocent parties who are trying to become Americans and didn't sign up for any of this stuff. We did it. We, can, we created this mess that we live in without commenting on anybody's motives today. Historically, opposition to immigration in the United States has been racially and religiously motivated in the ugliest, nastiest way possible. The Chinese Exclusion Act. First they had the one that says, no Chinese prostitutes and criminals. Then two years later they said, okay, we mean no Chinese people. But the first one was just snotty, <laughs> as if what you were keeping out were criminals and prostitutes. And then they passed the real law they wanted, which was no Chinese people, which we didn't really fix until like 1943. Uh, the anti-Irish stuff, the anti-Eastern European Jewish stuff from the 21 and 24 laws. These things were designed to keep them out. We were told that Jews had very low IQs because somebody tested them during World War I, um, and that the Irish would never assimilate because they couldn't, what, learn English? You know, All of this stuff, very, very ugly. The critics of immigration need to spend more time disassociating themselves from the history of that movement if they want to be heard on whatever merits they think they have by the targets of their apparent animus. And to pretend that there's no requirement to deal with that history, I think, is silly. Related to that, you hear a lot of talk from the kind of John McCain, Lindsey Graham's of the world and some uh, other commenters that basically the Republicans have to do this uh, electorally. Forget about it, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, that they're committing suicide if they don't sign on to something. Do you agree with that and do you think that's an effective, persuasive argument? Well, it's, it's not a persuasive audience, uh, argument for people who don't see themselves as political people. You have to do this because other people will vote against you. I mean, that's an argument for lots of dumb things. The challenge is, and I, and I think they do it backwards, then, then the at, it, uh, opponents of immigration say, well, you say if we pass immigration reform, all the Hispanics will vote with us. We say that's not true. Well, that's a straw man. Nobody says that. If we don't deal with the 10 million, 11 million undocumented, and stop threatening to deport them. You cannot have a civil conversation with Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans and, and subcontinent Americans. Because all of them, the ones who vote and are citizens, have a relative, a friend, a neighbor who's threatened with deportation. And this idea that I've heard from some conservatives, well, we're going to go up and say, ma'am, you know, we want to talk to you, we're the Republicans, we're pro-life and you're pro-life and we're for traditional marriage and we're for low taxes and why don't we talk about all things that we agree on while Igor here goes upstairs and grabs your aunt and drags her down the stairs in manacles and throws her in the back of the vehicle here and takes her across the border to Guatemala and then we can have our conversation about all things we agree on. You never have that conversation. So it's not that if you do immigration reform you win the votes of Asian Americans and Hispanic Americans and all immigrant communities. Talk to Catholic Americans. A lot of them have a collective memory that's a hundred years old for crying out loud, but they we're immigrants. You know. Our great great
grandmother were immigrants and they were mistreated and when they see it happening again, they personalize it. They mean me. They say they mean them, but they mean me. So the votes that Republicans are losing are not just Hispanics. It's way broader than that. Throw away comprehensive immigration reform. You can vote yes, yay or nay on a single idea. E-verify, would you vote yay or nay? Absent immigration reform. Well, I'm not in favor of, of uh, E-verify putting the government between every American and a job. I'd much rather, if, if, I think the way to have secure borders is a guest worker program. I think that the height of fences is not what does it. We went from a million people being arrested a year down to 40,000 with Eisenhower's Bracero program. And then when the Democrats and the labor unions killed it, it went back up to a million. So you want to have a secure border, have doors that people will go to because they can come in and work. Um, that's the important thing. People that think that building higher walls or deeper walls or moats and alligators and stuff, and then a police state when you get here, in case we didn't catch you the last time, they're chasing after problems that can be fixed more easily by expanding liberty rather than contracting it. On that note, thank you very much, Grover, for the uh, update on uh, immigration reform. For Reason TV, I'm Matt Welch.